Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see all of you today. Welcome, Lori and Luke. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, I'm Rachel Nemeth. I am the CEO of Opus Training. We're really excited to be here today to discuss how owners and operators are overcoming the challenges of today's workforce, a workforce that's diverse, that is multi-generational and coming to the table with different skill sets than ever before. Um, so before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I want to take a minute to thank uh, Guest, S Guest XM, powered by Black Box Intelligence, who's hosting this webinar today. Their industry data and insights are driving the top of this discussion, and, and that's really where I want to begin. Um, so let's start with some insights. And then Lori, Luke, I'm going to turn it over to you. So in the theme of thinking about overcoming the challenges with today's workforce, let's start with talking about turnover. Um, turnover continues to be higher than pre-pandemic levels year over year across the board. For management, it's frankly shockingly higher. Um, limited service is up 13%, full service is up 6%, and the, the pool of experienced talent is getting shallower. Um, baby boomers are retiring, and Gen Z, which we're going to talk about today, uh, which makes up 68 million Americans, is entering the workforce. So there are hourly workforce, there are our managers, and this generational shift is really forcing restaurants to rethink their approach about attracting and retaining talent, especially when it comes to management, which is really our theme today. And if we dig deeper, turnover between managers who are not GMs, uh, which is here on the left, and those who are GMs, which is here on the right, um, on the non-GM side, manager attrition really seems to be due to an increase in competition for these roles, right? That the top reasons that they're leaving are for higher compensation and the promise of an immediate promotion. The GM reasons on the right are really driven by their current work situation. So some of the top reasons for leaving are poor work-life balance and just overall job satisfaction. With that in mind and, and thinking about some of this, this data that Black Box Intelligence has collected, uh, we're bringing in our panel today to talk about this and some of their own experiences with managers who span the generations and thinking through some of those strategies that they have implemented for better or for worse to help solve some of these problems. Um, so we have Luke Holden, CEO and founder of Luke's Lobster. And we have Lori Goldstrom, VP of training at Taim Mediterranean. Uh, Luke, I'm gonna start with you for a quick intro. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience, a little bit about your business, just the, the nuts and bolts here? Yeah, thanks for having me today. So um, Luke's Lobster is a vertically integrated seafood company. Um, I am actually a third generation lobsterman. My father was the very first licensed lobster processor here in the state of Maine. So I grew up on the back of fishing boats on the working waterfront in seafood production facilities and Really, that's uh, um, what makes, in part, um, Luke's uh, uniquely special. The, the second side of that is is our dedication to people and and the communities from which we of which we impact um, in our supply chain. Um, but today, where Luke stands, uh, we've got uh, I think twenty one um, restaurants in the U.S. over thirteen different states. Uh, we've got. Um, uh, 12 restaurants between Tokyo and Singapore um, that are franchise or license deals. And then um, given our vertical integration piece, we are also um, a large wholesale seafood supplier. So in 2019, we won um, the uh, Perishable uh, Supplier of the Year Award for Whole Foods. We handle all of their lobster products. Um, Last year, we won uh, the Supplier of the Year for Benihana's. Uh, we did all their lobster products. Um, and then uh, the other parts of the business that have been growing 
quite significantly uh, post the pandemic are our CPG business. Um, so our uh, consumer packaged goods, like value added seafood products in grocery stores, and then our D to C uh, e-commerce business. So um, we've got those primary supply chains and then kind of work all the way back to uh, the boat or the fisherman, um, fisherwoman in our uh, supply chain. So. Uh, very much a family-oriented, family-led uh, business. We're uh, 15 years young this October, um, and uh, there's no no place I'd rather be spending my time. Thanks, Luke. Excited to dig in with you. I'm going to toss it to Lori. Lori, VP of Training at Taim. Tell us about your business so we can get to know you a little better. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori. Um, I lead the training team, people development, and HR for Time Meta Training Kitchen. Just very happy to be here. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so a little bit about Time. We were founded, um, we're chef and immigrant founded, which has is really a great story for us. And we are Eastern Mediterranean fashion fast casual. We started as all vegetarian and have evolved. Um, over the years to include meat as well, except for one location that will always be vegetarian. Um, we have, currently have 19 locations and we're mainly based in New York City. Um, we are in five different states, but we um, our first location opened in West Village in the city and um, we've grown since then. Um, we've really, um, we're getting ready to gear up for growth um, next year. And so we're in phase right now, just uh, building systems and getting us ready. Um, after almost 20 years of, of this being in business, we're really proud that we serve the best falafel you will ever taste, I promise you. It's very um, authentic to Israeli street food. That's a little bit about us. Thank you. I can attest to both of you that your both of your products are top notch in your category because both of your stores are right down the street from our office, so we eat there all the time. <laughs> um, so I want to dig a little bit deeper to get you to know you and your brands better with a fun little exercise. And then we're going to talk about some of this data that we've been um, going through. Um, I forgot to show photos of uh, Lori's beautiful team. So um, I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Um, what are two words to describe yourself? And what are two words to describe your brand, your company's brand? Anyone want to take it away? <laughs> I'll come off mute then. Um, I would say that uh, two qualities to describe myself are hardworking and empathetic. And two, um, these aren't words, but we're, we are obsessive about our, the quality of our seafood at Luke's and we're really focused on the communities that we that we impact both before the seafood gets to us and then after the seafood gets to us. So we're very community focused and very quality focused. I think that's Lori's cue. I will say, so this was harder than you think. So I'll start with Taim. Um, two words that best describe our brand, not necessarily two words, but the first one is tasty falafel. And the second one is guest obsessed. And, um, if you ever want to have some fun with your friends, um, put in a group text, what are two words to describe me? And, um, <laughs> you will get some really interesting answers, which I cannot use on this. Um, but something that came out of it, um, ambitious and passionate are two words that I would describe myself with. Love it. This is why I love this exercise. Uh, <laughs> um, well, let's get to it. I, you know, I, I, I want to point out this particular slide and get both of your reactions here um, to start. Lori, maybe we can start with you. For, for non-GM managers, how has the, the generational shift uh, really influenced the reasons for re for leaving. And in, in other words, like, are you seeing this at Taim right now, or are there any changes or, or differences that you've seen? It's very 
accurate for Taim right now for the non-GM managers, compensation is the driving factor for why people are leaving. Um, we do pay very competitively, but across the street, if they can get a dollar more, they're going to go there. Um, it's the mindset is compensation equals appreciation. And if you're not competitive in comp compensation, they're not gonna be loyal to you. Um, we also see that if we don't make a connection, um, so when, when I see personal reasons on there, I think, I think that's really interesting and it could mean a lot of things, but to me it means um, that they're not connected to the brand right off the bat. Um, and if they don't have a reason to connect or stay, um, they're, they're just gonna leave us. So fortunately for us, we have a really great story that people can connect with, but if we're unable to reach them right from the get-go, then we'll lose them within that first 30, 60, 90 day period. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that point to when we talk about ways to build that connectivity with new managers. Um, so I'm going to put a pin in that. Luke, I'm curious to get your perspective on what you're seeing on this slide here. What parts of it resonate and what parts don't with respect to, to Luke's? Yeah, um, if, if you wouldn't mind just going back one slide showing uh, um, the, the bar chart. Yeah, so we're, we would, most of our restaurants would be in that limited service category. And the reality is that we look the exact opposite of this data. Um, and I think, um, uh, I think that that's in part of how we've been um, reactive to the pandemic. I know that was a long time ago, but um, focusing in on how we survived in 2020 we really shifted uh, the expectations of the GM job. You know, we really asked the GM to go from being a market leader, get outside your four walls, drive sales, to um, to you know be the the GM that is interacting with the guest and running um, the food line, and uh, that worked while we were trying to survive. And then I think um, as sales came back and uh, we saw really good um, four wall margins, um, we also saw like historically, like double historically high turnover rates for us in the manager position. And at the same time, we've always had low turnover in the hourly position, but we basically halved it um, in the last several years. We have had almost no turnover in the hourly position while having historically um, uh, again double high uh, turnover in the in the GM position. And I think a lot of that has had to do with compensation. So um, now going back to your next slide, like when we asked the GM to do um, the non GM job, uh, ultimately one implication that that had was because they're driving scheduling, they don't take tips. Right, GMs managers never take tips, so we took um, we took the GM, we displaced uh, uh, non-GM duties, re reduced headcount, and and then therefore like increased uh, the amount of tips that the that the non-GM teammates were earning. So we have like dramatically increased compensation for our hourly workforce by changing the GM duty over the last you know th three years and and i think like that would be you know be beyond all the great things that we're doing as a as a brand and as a team to drive engagement and um, career development opportunities uh just looking at the slide in a reflective way i think like we've like really engineered a much higher compensation profile for our non-gms by again by asking our gms to do that job but then not compensating them with the tip pool um, and, and that's, that's, uh, drive more compensation for hourly employees, which I'm sure has played into our super, super low turnover on the hourly basis. Flip side, it's also probably played really high, really significant into our high geo GM turnover, um, because, you know, work-life balance is, is shifted, right? Like running, 
just the business inside the four walls and, and the lack of job satisfaction, satisfaction, the number two reason, you know, I think, um, uh, I think that those would play into, you know, major reasons for, for why we've experienced the major turnover we have, um, for us at the, at the GM position. And then I think later on, I can talk a little bit about what we're getting into to fix that. Yeah. That, that I find that so interesting that basically the, the skill set, requ the the requirement of skill has changed, and as a result, the 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 demands, of course, of the the role have changed. The comp has changed. Um, what's the impact of that against the the kind of generation that you're working with? Is there any correlation, or is it much more around the the economic aspect, the the money piece? Do you think? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'm not sure really, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, one of our reactive measures, um, has at the end of the day, like, I think people quit on people. Um, and that's like the biggest, uh, um, that's the biggest driver for, for, for engagement, um, or the opposite turnover. And, and so we've like really doubled down on the, on the talent. Um, and, uh, and the headcount of our directors of operations who oversee our, our GMs and, um, in one of our key strategic pillars for 2024 is, is really focusing on teammate engagement and, um, and making sure that everybody knows that. Um, so I think that, uh, um, I think I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that, uh, uh, investing in in the leadership team and the, um, is, is, is in a lot, it's, it's relatively new three, six months for us, but it's seemingly having a super, uh, positive impact on our, our GM base. Thank you. And, and I think that's a great segue into, to digging a little bit deeper here on some of those strategies in order to, um, just address some of the, the gaps right now that you're seeing, Lori, I wanted to toss this to you to start to kick things off at Taim. Um, over the past few years, you know, Taim is a 20 year old brand. You said it yourself that it's been through a lot of growth over the past couple of years and you're, you're building a foundation for future growth right now. How have you adapted your employee training and engagement strategies to reflect that pace? Um, as you're preparing for growth, what are, how, how have the strategies changed and, and what remains the same? Yes. Um, so first of all, I have not even been with Taim for a year. So just, but I'm going to talk about overall philosophy and how it's changed um, in my previous work um, versus today. But um, some things in the past that we just can't do what we did in the past. It just doesn't work anymore with training. So um, we have Opus as our training platform. It's one way that we train people. And um, and for those, if there's anybody here that doesn't know a lot about Opus, but it's um, specifically created for the deskless workforce so that you can easily create <clears throat> micro learning sessions for them. And um, I think that, that's the biggest thing. Old school thinking, you can't have your cell phone with you. Today, we want you to have your cell phone with you. We want it out. We're going to do your training. It's going to be fast. It's going to be two to three minutes. And then you're on to your next task. <clears throat> now, where it's changed with the generations, um, so 50% of our workforce right now is Gen Z, who has never known a life without technology. So... <laughs> So we had to um, change the way we're thinking with with the technology base in our in our restaurants, not just for training, but in other areas. Um, they're just you know extremely intelligent in that way. Anything else you want me? You looking for Rachel? 
No, I think that's, inc it's, it's interesting too, around like just, it's not only the strategies that you're putting forth, but it's what the expectation is too, and how it's changed from, um, yeah. from your team. What's the, just so we can level set a little bit, what's, um, the profile of a time manager? Um, are these folks who are, have a lot of industry experience? Are they pretty green? How would you describe your, your manager workforce? So if we're talking first, just general managers, about 50% of our GMs have been with us two years or more, um, mainly Hispanic, Latino, um, and half of our workforce has grown with us over the years. So we have uh, GMs in place anywhere from, from two to 10 years in that category. And then secondly, the other half of the GM are have learned somewhere else and are bringing those skills to time and we're finding um lately the skills that they're bringing are very tactical skills and not necessarily the people skills um that we used to see similar to what luke was saying earlier um so and and our, our workforce is is diverse in age a little bit it's like almost 50 50 um millennial to gen z's um with a little little Xers and boomers in there too. <laughs> so most um, of our workforce has a, is used to having that technology and wants it and thrives on it. And if we don't have it, we're losing them too. Well, and, and I'm curious to hear from you, Luke, what that split is. Lori, what I heard was hearing from you is that it's about 50, 50 homegrown managers, so to speak. Uh, yes. And the other 50% really coming still industry, but they're coming from, from other brands and you're really having to outsource. Um, Luke, is it kind of the same split for you? It, it, I, I, I'd almost piggyback everything. Um, Lori said it's very similar for us. Um, you know, we're, in the 50% of GMs that we're, we're recruiting or we're finding some success is focusing in on the quality of life piece that they are getting back by joining Luke's. And so like the migration from, um, from fine dining um, or casual dining, that's got like a late night scene um, to, uh, you know, more of a fast casual where we're locking the door by, you know, eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. And, you know, running um, two shifts and um, uh, it, like we're finding a lot of success in those experienced GMs that are just getting crushed by um, by by mostly by management teams that like still haven't shifted um, expectations around like what the economic model like should look like and needs to look like in order to sustain have a good have like a a good job for for a general manager so like we've seen we've seen the most success in keeping general man new general managers for l longer than um you know the first 100 days when like it, i guess just to be frank when they're coming from like a really terrible situation and coming into like a, a, a an environment where we can dramatically improve their their quality of life and focusing in on 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 that. So um, the other thing I would share too, just we're, we're doing sort of the same migration from paper training logs to um, you know TikTok size bites um, in 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 Opus. And I would I'd say the other thing is we're trying to use Opus for like it's not just a training platform, but it's like a communication platform. So like create more gravity there. Um, and, and when you can create more gravity around like, this is where a teammate gathering is happening. And this is like, this is a news update that's happening. And like, here's some positivity around, um, uh, uh, around like something somebody achieved, like, like create more of more gravity for why people should be using like, what is a typical, you know, LMS, uh, uh, it, it was the sign. I don't think that's typically LMS was typically used, right? It's like, that's where you go to train. Now it's like, this is where you go to, to learn and engage. And, and, and I think that that like creates more of like a, oh yeah, maybe I'm interested in that learning module and I'm going to proactively take it and I'm going to, you know, show my manager, I'm curious and, you know, willing to explore promotion opportunities by being curious. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, 
much of uh, but like much of what Lori said is true for us. Well, and and it, I think it leads me to the, my curiosity rests in here, which is there's you've like noticed where your team is engaging, where they're getting excited, where they're discovering new things. Uh, and not just on technology, but what are the things that really make them tick, right? Luke, you referenced that we know that folks are looking for quality of life, for example. What are some of the other things that, and incentives that are really driving your team at this point that, that you've seen work? And I think it's gonna also come to another question, which is what hasn't worked? <laughs> Lori, maybe we can toss it to you. Absolutely. So. Similar to what Luke just said is the connection piece. So um, people want to be connected with each other and and us driving that connection, whether it's through, um, so we use Google as a platform and the Google spaces we use for celebrations where all the GMs can join in and post pictures and celebrate. Um, or potentially using Opus. So what we've been doing that has really built a connection lately is focusing our diversity initiatives in Opus um, to do short um, highlights or spotlights on people in our restaurants that they know they've seen um, for um, Women's History Month. We have three women who have grown and have been with us for an extremely long time. Um, people are really connected to that. Um, Another initiative that we're, so one of our um, company initiatives is really elevating the guest experience, which has been a challenge um, to teach, <laughs> um, but um, we have another system that we use, it's called Honor Roll as an incentive platform. And what Honor Roll does is reward you with points for different things that you do. One of them is attendance, Great, um, but another one is answering a daily trivia question, which ours are all focused right now around the guest experience. And then the third one is if they reach a, as a team, a, a, um, a certain score on their surveys, their whole team gets points. They take those points, they cash them in, they go get a Starbucks gift card, Amazon gift card, whatever they want. Um, so people are really excited about that right now. And anything that has to do with competition, because restaurant to restaurant competition, it builds a connection and it builds a, a drive in everyone um, in our restaurants to really want to achieve um, achieve success for the restaurants. So those are some things we're doing right now that are working. Well, and I would imagine a lot of that success is also driven from you having built a framework around that. It's not just introducing them to a system. It's saying, this is how we operate. This is our culture. This is what matters to us. It's driving a great guest experience. And this is how we do it. And this is how we reward you for that. Um, so kind of bringing them into the fold um, with a, teaching them how to be better managers and empowering them, um, especially in light of the, the kind of um, profile of management that you were describing. Lots of millennials, lots of Gen Z. Um, quick uh, relevant question for you, Lori, coming from Sarah Tanner. How do you track the points, she asked. So the platform on a roll does all of the work for me. I don't have to do anything. They have integrations. We use Tattle for our, our guest experience. They, they do all the integrations for us and they track it for us. So I'm hands off except writing the questions. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, Luke, I'm, I'm curious to hear, is there anything additional that you've done or, or different that you've done at Luke's in around creating incentives for GMs, um, especially in light of just the turnover that you've seen, ways to, to connect them more deeply with the brand? Yeah, um, so just a couple of things like, first we've, we've continued to double down on creating really achievable and clear um, uh, incentive plans, bonus plans. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that's something that's worked, like spending more time um, talking about uh, what they can do specifically to drive sales um, or manage costs and how that results in more earnings for them is like, 
I know it's back to the basics, but like uh, we've been like super intentional and focused on that, and it's definitely working. Um, it's definitely uh, uh, frequency of of payment being quarterly um, has been like a really strong um, engagement tool. Uh, moments of of connectiveness is something that we're spending a ton of time and energy on. So bringing our managers up to Maine um, in uh, really like an immersive experience where they get to go out in a lobster boat, get into our seafood processing company, be in our flagship restaurant up here, uh, exposure to a guest speaker, like um, learn a little bit more about the brand. But like really, those are all great things. But what it's really about is bringing those people together and like introducing the GM from Vegas to the GM in, in Miami and, and creating connectedness and like moments of, of, uh, um, of friendship. And like, that's something we've been super, super focused on. Um, definitely, um, on the diversity side of things, making sure that, uh, we have representation in the management team that is, uh, representative of, of what the work, the entry level position looks, looks and, and feels like. So um, we've been more uh, focused than ever on measuring that and um, identifying uh, teammates that are developable and promotable and celebrating when we get that right. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, like uh, we can all do a lot of things to impact um, our community. And, and sometimes that creates moments of engagement. Sometimes it creates, uh, um, uh, stickiness with, with the teammate, but like really what matters at the end of the day is like, um, is like, can you, can you take someone who's great, invest in them and, and are, and help them earn more compensation at the end of the day. And like, I think when you get that, uh, when you just like focus on that piece of it, like, and you know, don't get caught up in a lot of the other stuff, like it's when you like, get a good effective flywheel. Like you just, in a day, like you've got to, you got to find ways to develop people's career and, and do it as efficiently as possible. And it's hard when everyone has different paths too. I think, you know, everyone works at a different pace. Everyone grows at a different pace. So no matter what we do as operators, if we are, you know, it, if you're building a world in which you can create those incentives for growth, um, how do you still make it feel one size fits one? Is it because, and it's a, it's a question for both of you. If, is there a clear, you know, Luke, you were referencing this, um, Lori, I know you do this at, at time is like, you know, what does next look like? How do I know, um, what's going? A lot of the infrastructure reflects that. How do you approach training? Mm -hmm with management who have varied levels of experience? Is it coming back to just learning from one another or, or how are you addressing those skill gaps? I would say for me, the wonderful thing about a growing business and a small business is that we can adapt rather easily um, with training and we can develop the training that that person needs and we can physically just go there, sit down with them, have our training um, manager go in, sit down, assess the needs of that individual and build a plan around their needs. Um, where in the past we used to, it was one size fits, fits most. And we would say, here you are, first two weeks you do this, the next two weeks you do that, the next two weeks you do that. Um, when we're bringing in GMs today that are um, different skill levels and from different backgrounds and maybe not even a fast casual GM, it, um, they, it, you have to adapt to it. And um, as we grow, it will be interesting, but um, our plan is building out different modules and, um, and giving them the modules that they need to be successful and not necessarily have to go through an assigned program that every everybody else goes through. Super well said, and just sort of building on that and not saying we're there today, but I think it's a lot about, um, in GM's particular, it's like, it's, it's, it's the teammate journey. So 
from from the employer branding as part of the recruiting process to like how you ultimately uh, select somebody, what kind of testing you put them through to evaluate their skills day one, and then um, and then tailoring um, like what a training program looks like. Like we found that um, you know somebody who's su super strong on the guest side and a, a, and needs needs some investment on on uh, the, the operational math side of the equation. Like like it's we're doing these things on the recruiting side of things to assess whether or not they're capable of joining or running the shack. But then prior days, like we weren't adapting the training programs. So like what, what sense does it make to dislocate what we learned during the recruiting process from the training process? And so I think we're getting better about putting these, uh, we call them pips, but um, putting these pips in place where uh, they're, um, performance improvement plans. And it's, it's, there's no negative connotation to it. It's, it's like, here's, here's where you're at. And if you want to, uh, ascend the very, the, making the, those steps of the career ladder, like as, as simple as possible so that you can make them as measurable as possible. But when you start putting pips in place that, that say, okay, like here's where you're at and here's the next thing we need to work on to ascend your, your career. And, and again, when you, when you get it right, and, um, there are those promotable, uh, celebratory moments, like just like really celebrating them, right. And making sure that, uh, um, making sure that you kind of lock in that wind with, win with, uh, um, with, with sharing, uh, sh sharing, um, moments of, of positivity with the entire team, I think is just like super important. Yeah, in the end, we all want to just feel connected to something. And I think we, we lost a lot of that several years ago. So, um, well, we're coming up on time. There's a question for Lori, and then I want to think future forward um, to, to wrap things up. Um, and also, if anyone listening has any other questions, please feel welcome to throw them into the q and I would love to toss them to Lori and, and Luke. Um, Lori, Mary has a question specifically for you. Um, you've worked with lots of, and maybe you could give a, a, a quick, uh, a bullet point of some of the places you've worked. Uh, you've worked with all sorts of different sizes of brands. Um, what could smaller brands learn from large brands on best practices or even the reverse? What could small brands learn from large brands or you, you get it. <laughs> Strike that, reverse it. <laughs> yes, I get it. Um, well, first of all, so I came um, from Kava, which I grew, I was a part of the team that grew from nine locations. And when I left, it was almost 300 locations. And then prior to that was with Chipotle from 600 locations to over 2000 locations. So a little bit of difference between the two. And and it, this is an interesting question. When I was in Kava, we um, acquired Zoe's Kitchen. Kava was at about 50 to 70 restaurants, I believe, and acquired Zoe's Kitchen at 250. Thinking, hey, we can learn a lot from this bigger company. I find it the exact opposite. You learn a lot more from the smaller companies when you're, you're scrappy, when you it's like this family atmosphere and people are so connected with each other and and i think as you grow you just by the way life works you lose that a little bit um as as the business grows so when i look at it i really i really think it's important to take a look at those the atmosphere of those family run um restaurants even mom and pops to see what's so great because you, you know, you don't see employees leaving those mom and pop restaurants. They want to stay for life. They're loyal to them. They have something to give back and they feel like um, they're part of something instead of just being a cog in the wheel of a larger organization. So thanks for the question, Mary. Those are incredible words to end a, a really a thematic conversation around management and and um, 
finding ways to engage that workforce, not only to reduce turnover, but just to create a sense of belonging uh, and growth. So, um, well, I want to take a moment um, to talk about what's next for the both of you. What are your priorities for the business for this year with regard to talent? Laura, you wanna, you've been doing so great going first. You wanna, you wanna stay <laughs> Well, with it? thanks, Luke. Um, right, <clears throat> so this year, um, it's really interesting that you said this, Luke, um, the, the, um, the PIPs is something we're doing as well, really based on competencies and the people skills. Um, so I'm really excited to, um, we have just such a great group of people and see how that impacts them and their lives. So we're focused number one on the GM. The GM is the most important person in our organization um, and our area managers are the most influential. So we are focused on those two roles to grow them. And um, I, th I think a great another great thing about a growing small company is you can get people really excited with our growth because there's other avenues they can go into. So IT, marketing, training, there's so many opportunities for them. So I'm really um, excited um, to see where that goes. And of course, our other huge priority, it has to do with engagement. And, and when I look at engagement, I am very proud to say we just launched an engagement survey and the highest scoring question on that survey is how they rated, I'm proud to work at Taim. So building pride in people's work is extremely important to us this year as well. That's amazing. Um, I, 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 I couldn't have said it better. Um, and it's a, again, like a very analogous situation um, at Luke's, we brought in a chief people officer um, uh, maybe two months ago. And so we're, you know, we're doubling down our commitment on on the GM and, and the DOs. And um, we're launching an, a, a new engagement survey as well um, with uh, a, a well-rounded engagement survey, but a mentor of mine um, said that you know the most important question on that engagement survey is is how comfortable you feel giving your supervisor feedback and um and and so we're we're really excited to kind of dig into that and um and and focus on you know improving all all levels of management within the organization um it, to to say something um uh uh different than Lori said is that we're we're also, we just have like a really exciting growth, uh, growth pipeline for 2024 and 2025. And um, it feels a lot like 2009, 2010, where there's just like an incredible amount of real estate opportunities and, um, and underemployed people, um, which is like, it, it's like, it's a little counter, right? Like it's this business and this industry feels like a little sick right now. Um, but uh, it, in my my own perspective, is that, like this business was the hardest to run outside of the 2020 2021 period. It was the hardest to run in 2019, when there was just an incredible amount of competition for people and for real estate. Like there was just everything was was super super competitive, and and so I'm really excited to really grow Luke's quite aggressively on the restaurant side of the business. Um, this year and next year, again, because I just think like the environment is like very ripe for um, bringing uh, um, bringing people um, in, developing them, uh, finding underemployed people, and and real estate that is uh, there's just a lot of great real estate opportunities. Incredible. Well, there's a lot to be excited about, uh, and I can hear it in both of your voices. Um, you know, despite the the scary, truthfully, data around turnover uh, that we're seeing today. I think we're seeing brands like yours take really positive steps to solve for it, maybe in ways that we've tried in the past and they're working now when they didn't before, and maybe in completely new ways. Um, also really interesting takeaways around what, uh, not what 
small brands can learn from large brands, but perhaps what large brands can learn from small brands around ingenuity and experimentation. And, um, and so, uh, Lori, Luke, thank you so, so much for joining me here today. Thank you to the guest XM team. Uh, my name is Rachel Nemeth, uh, and we will see you all next time. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>